if anything has driven home the point that humans need to listen to nature it's the current pandemic and that's why our interest in today's guest because when nature whispers she listens professor shannon olson is a chemical ecologist which means she listens to chemical conversations happening in diverse ecosystems professor olson has been part of the national center for biological sciences here in bangalore and she now heads the eco network here so let's welcome her to the program hello professor and welcome to spotlight with sandhya thank you so much it's a, it's an honor to speak with you and to see you again shannon you currently heading a new initiative right the eco network so tell us a little bit more about it because it seems really remarkable my main job has been as a professor and i do research on these chemical conversations my research has taken me all over the country i've worked in in the oak forests of nagaland of uh, the northern sikkim himalayan peaks and kashmir and the western ghats and rajasthan so i've gotten to see all of these different uh, beautiful ecosystems up close where i've been studying the conversations right out in the natural environment and while i was there um i, I couldn't help but notice that the conversations are also changing very very rapidly in this country because of how we humans are changing our environment and we're doing this in in a multitude of different ways where we're changing the way that the land is being used we're converting it from forest to farmland or to to uh, urban areas we are uh, using chemicals like pesticides and fertilizers in our in our environment we have pollution plastic pollution other types of water pollution air pollution all of these things are ways that we all are very familiar with that are really changing our world and by changing that environment we're also changing the way our, the organisms in those ecosystems can live in that environment whether they can live but also how they can live and so i noticed this happening it was undeniable that it was happening but i also during my time and doing my travels i've met countless individuals and and been able to become familiar with countless organizations government organizations ngos academic institutes um private and public enterprises in industry as well who are actually concerned with the same problem and they're all doing things they're all working they're working at the village level helping clean up water make better sanitation systems they're helping with nutrition they're helping with agriculture they're doing countless things across this country there's tremendous efforts going on but one of the um things that i also noticed throughout this entire process was that in fact they're all doing this in isolation right we're all working on our own little projects and and while they're great work and wonderful things they're not really connecting with each other so a couple of years ago in 2018 i had the chance to discuss this issue with the uh, principal scientific advisor to the government of india uh professor kv jaragavan so that's how the eco network was born and it's something that that uh psa and myself have developed and that he has steered and guided our 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 team in developing with partners who represent various aspects of of indian sectors science still remains very isolated it still remains very much tied to academic institutes and it's very siloed from the public but also from other sectors of society industry and others and academics really work on their own and the idea is can we bring academic science like i do closer to the rest of society by actually creating sort of a ambassadors who also serve as translators who can speak to a farmer or a politician or an industry leader or a lawyer or a doctor whoever it may be and be able to explain the science and and listen to that person listen to their concerns and make sure that the science is also reflecting those needs so, th so that's really the goal of the eco network it comes directly out of my own experiences in india meeting such wonderful people and seeing that we have all the tools at our disposal to really solve these problems we all want to solve them and we can solve them but it just requires us to work together to do so so that's really the heart of the echo network is working together through listening and that's where the name echo comes from it's the idea of calling out and having it come back and listening to the response I see that you've been propagating something called the one health approach 
what is that? Uh, could you explain a little bit more? Sure. Now, I, I will preface this by saying that I am myself not, not an expert on One Health. You know, I'm a, I, I am an ecologist, and I mentioned what I study. One Health is a much bigger concept, and of course, there are much better people that can discuss this. And, and as part of our efforts with ECHO, as you mentioned, we've had the pleasure to work with some of these wonderful thought leaders in our country who are very passionate about this issue. Essentially, what One Health is, is it's actually a concept and an approach that uh, simultaneously addresses human and animal and environmental health as one. And it uses all of the attention to all of those aspects of health to prevent, detect, and respond to infectious disease and other health issues. So essentially, the idea of One Health is that our health as humans is not only a product of human systems and health systems, but it's also a product of how healthy our environment is, how healthy our ecosystems are, and how healthy our wildlife is. An excellent example of that is this terrible pandemic that we're still very much in the throes of and, and very much suffering from in many ways. This pandemic is called a zoonotic disease, which means that it's born by animals. And those animals are coming in more and more contact with humans and with livestock by the changing of our environments, climate change, land use change, all of the things I mentioned earlier on are all affecting those animals and pushing them closer into contact with our livestock and with humans and making the, the possibility of transferring disease to humans much more likely. So a One Health approach recognizes that disease doesn't just come out of the air. It actually comes from an imbalance of all of these systems together. And that really, truly, to be healthy, we have to pay attention to the entire ecosystem of humans and environment and the animals and plants on the planet in order to really be healthy. Because we're all connected, as I said at the very beginning. So it is very, very much in tune with my, my passion as a scientist of connection with nature. That's true. Based on that, I would like you to tell us, you know, for the benefit of the lay people like me, what are the five things that you think we should be doing to preserve nature? And what are the five things that we should stop doing that harms nature? I, I think I'd like to reverse the thinking on that because we, we often talk about um, saving nature or taking care of nature as something that humans have to do for nature. It's our, it's our responsibility, it's our burden, it's our necessity to, to take care as stewards of the planet. But if you take a purely scientific view of this, okay, nature is incredibly adaptive, all right? So no matter what we do to it, nature is going to survive. The problem is, is that humans require certain conditions in order to survive on this planet. We need the water to be a certain way. We need the air to be a certain way. We need certain kinds of food. We can't eat everything on the planet. We need certain kinds of food in order to survive. And those are the things that are going to change. So it's not that we need to save nature. We actually need to save ourselves. Nature will go on. We've, it's shown over and over again in the history of the, the planet that there's been these mass extinctions that have happened and the earth has gone on, but it's gone on in a very different way than it was before. And so the earth will continue. We just might not continue with it. So with that said, when I think about this process, I don't think of it in terms of, you know, how to save the, the, the natural world. I think of how do we save ourselves? And that requires us to balance ourselves with nature. Everything we've talked about, One Health and everything, all of the other conversations are about retaining that balance. We really need to retain that we are not changing our world to the, fact, to the point that it's not only unrecognizable to us, but it's unlivable for us. That is the real concern. So to me, the five areas where I think that, that we really need to have the, the most change right now, and, and I'll talk particularly of India because that's where I live and that's where I work as well and where the ECHO network actually functions, is one is in, in changing our agricultural systems, making them more sustainable, making them more ecologically friendly, um, putting less chemicals and damage into the environment and having system food systems that actually bring, give back to our ecosystems. I think another one is uh, actually thinking about climate smart energy systems, 
uh, renewable energy, solar power, other types of renewable energy systems that cut down on the production of, of chemicals and, and carbon dioxide and other harmful substances into our environment. Another is waste management and sanitation, not uh, polluting our waters and air and our soil with extraneous chemicals and certainly plastics, which can take hundreds of years to break down. And the One Health approach that I also mentioned, which is this idea of paying attention to the health of all of our, our ecosystems and our organisms, as well as our own health. And all of that needs to be couched within the, the concept of public awareness. People have to be educated, they have to be aware, they have to understand uh, our connection with nature, and they have to really understand that it's the, the connection with nature that is keeping us alive and not the other way around. So when I that those are big concepts, and those are really things that we think about on the level of you know state governments, national governments, even you know international organizations like the World Health Organization. So it's very difficult to parse those things on an individual level. So I, I think if I understood your question, you also meant what can we do as individuals, right? What can someone listening to this do in their home? Um, and besides, obviously. Uh, promoting these these issues, talking about them, uh, trying to uh, elect and promote individuals who also are passionate about these kinds of issues in your local governments and, and national government. Besides that, one of the things that you can do is, number one, from food systems, it is just to try to pay attention where your food is coming from. As much as possible, if you have the means, you can grow your own food if you can. If you're not able to do that because of where you live or your, your situation, try to buy locally, try to buy from, from farmers where you know the techniques that they're utilizing. Um, local agriculture is always better because it requires less transport. And if you can buy products that are, that are grown in more ecological ways, then that's even better. In terms of energy systems, of course, trying to conserve energy, reducing your travel, also, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle, and refuse. And, and it's really those of us who are the most privileged that have the most responsibility. Honestly, in India, the, the, the poorest of our, of our communities, they are already doing all of this out of necessity. They're not the ones that are contributing to the problem. It's really the other end. Those of us who are very privileged at the top of that, who have the most expendable income, we are the ones that really have to work much harder on this. And in terms of the last becoming aware, you're doing it, what you're doing right now by inviting me, which I'm so honored to get a chance to talk about this is a great way of doing this, but also really promoting this in our education systems. Our children need to hear much more about ecology and the environment and learn much more about biodiversity in their schools. I think, you know, village children and, and rural children, are, they have such a privilege of living out in nature. So they, when I go to villages, I, I hear them, I hear how knowledgeable they are of the importance of our ecosystems. Urban children don't have that privilege. They're often very isolated from their, their the natural world and so their connection with nature is, is much less direct. So we have to teach them. We have to make it much bigger part of our curricula and a requirement for, for our children to understand that we, we rely on nature for our survival. Because actually by doing all of these things that also will drive our economy forward. It will bring more jobs. It will bring more, po more opportunities more knowledge. It will be a positive thing. Actually working with nature always creates more benefits and not more cost to, to people. It's been shown world over and it will happen in India too. And I would like to see that after this, this uh, difficult period we're going through where we have a lot of economic issues to deal with that we actually think about creating our new economy that's based on these sort of ecological green energy, conservative, climate smart, types of techniques, because I do think there's tremendous possibility and we have an incredibly smart people, right? I want to understand, and I think our uh, viewers would be very interested in knowing how a girl like you from a very small town in, uh, in uh, you know, rural uh, America made it to the field of science. And it's a very niche area that you're in. Did you face any problems because you were a woman? And moving on from being a scientist, you're also part of the, um, you know, uh, leadership in science. I'm asking you this question because we want to encourage more young girls and young women to take up science as a career, you know, 
STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, you would like to encourage them, and you would be a great role model for them. So, by trying to understand your experiences and how you overcame any obstacles that you did, and how you managed to fit in a completely different culture from being in a small town with a couple of hundred people, you made your home in this vast nation. How do you manage to, you know, put gender aside and come to the top? in your feet? Well, I have been very fortunate. Um, I am a first generation college graduate, so um, first in a PhD, obviously, as well. So so uh, I, I remember when I had very encouraging parents who encouraged me to do whatever I could. Um, and, and in any capacity they have, they have encouraged me throughout my life and still do. I also have an incredibly encouraging husband who has been very supportive of my career and has helped with childcare and cooking and cleaning the toilet and all of the things that you have to do, right? So he's been a very, very supportive. And I think that for women uh, who want to pursue any career, okay, because we are by choice and by culture and by lots of reasons, we also are overburdened with other aspects of, of child care and home care and things like that, we must have some sort of support. It can come from a husband or it can come from a sister or it can come from a parent or a grandmother, but we have to have somebody in our lives who supports them, supports us. And it's something that I really encourage in all of my, my students and my younger colleagues that I said, you know, you need to find somebody who will support you, um, will help you out because it is very difficult you, and you can't do it all. And that's not true when they say you can't do everything. You can do one thing at a time really well and maybe a little bit of the other thing, but you can't do everything perfect all the time as you very well know. And I think that the thing that I would say is to know your place and this is often a phrase that's used in admonition. You often give it to people saying, you better know your place, meaning you're thinking too much of yourself. But when I use that phrase, I mean actually knowing my value and my worth as an individual, because I think that as women, we are often undervalued. And we are often uh, treated as if we are not as worthwhile as other members of the community, whoever that may be. And as a younger woman scientist, I always thought that at some point I would get to the level, you know, where I'd, I'd have enough accolades, I'd have enough great publications in science, I'd have a title of professor or whatever it is, and I would just get the respect because you know, I just would, ha would have earned it by that point. And I thought I wasn't getting respect as a young woman because I, w I hadn't done anything yet. But the fact of the matter is <laughs> that you don't always get respect no matter what level you are at. And sometimes you have to demand it. And you have to demand that you be respected because you have to know your place. You know your value. And you can't always have the luxury, especially as you are climbing the ranks of, of telling a superior who, who dictates your career that they are not respecting you. The only option you have is to try to avoid working with that person and try to find somebody who does respect you. And I think that, that knowing your value early on, realizing that respect isn't always given, it sometimes must be demanded, is a, is a very important thing that all women need to hear. And everyone deserves respect no matter where they come from, not just women, but no matter what, you know, what kind of socioeconomic background or race or religion or anything they come from, we all deserve the same respect and we don't always get it. And I think that has to be sometimes asked for and you have to ask for it because you are the only one ultimately who can advocate for yourself. So I think that is something that I would tell young women, we need more women in science women provide important viewpoints from, from our collective experiences as women, as mothers, as daughters, as, as, uh, as sisters. We bring unique experiences that are extremely valuable to science. We often think of science as an objective process that is 
separated from how humans think, you know, it's objective, it's dry, it's cold, but science is done by people. So science is 100% shaped by who does the science and we need more women doing science because it changes it, it deepens it. We need more villagers from remote places of India doing science. We need more uh, people from, from, from poor backgrounds, from, from different types of religions. We need all of that. Diversity is incredibly essential to scientific progress and I see it improving. Every year I see more and more people who are so different from me entering the ranks of science and I'm so grateful for that and we still have a long way to go for women and for all minorities but I, I, I can see it getting better and um, and it's important because that's what's going to make science even better. That's wonderful. Thank you very much for joining the program Professor Shannon Olson and uh, to our viewers. I hope you enjoyed this session of Spotlight with Sandhya. Please do subscribe to the Raintree Media channel and share and like it. You can also listen to this interview as a podcast on Spotify. Until I'm back with another interesting guest in the next episode, take care and bye-bye.